<coughs> I think the children can be dismissed now. Would you need to change? <coughs> The scripture reading is, uh, as it shows there, and it's going to be Luke uh, chapter 3, verses 15, 15 through, <clears throat> through 20. Is that right? Okay. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the tongue of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and, <clears throat> and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod has done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. About 12 or 13 years ago, you might have seen a, a video that went viral that was called The Last Lecture. Um, there was this lecture series by Carnegie Mellon, um, a, a big university, that they were doing these series of talks by academics and professors who would get up and give their, what would be their last lecture. I mean, the most important things they've learned, the, the best concepts and ideas in their field. And they asked this man who was in the, uh, I believe he's in the computer science uh, field or technology, Randy Posh, to give uh, a talk in this series. And right before he was scheduled to give the talk, he found out that he had terminal cancer and uh, only had about six months to live. And so he gave his talk and it was not abstract. Um, it was very real. Um, it was really, he, he, was not a, he was not a believer. Um, he has some really interesting perspectives. It was kind of funny. He had a, some good, really it was some good biblical truth contained in what he said. But uh, a couple of, before he died, he worked together with somebody and, and actually wrote a book called The Last Lecture. And one of the chapters in the book uh, was just a, a page or two long and it's entitled, It Never Came Up. And Randy tells the story of going through his dad's belonging when his dad had passed away. And he's going through pictures and knickknacks and little things that his dad had saved. And he um, was going through all of his dad's papers. And, and with, you know, insurance papers and business papers and different stuff, he found a citation that his father received during his service in World War II that he knew nothing about. Apparently, on April 11th, 1945, his dad's unit had come under German artillery fire, and his dad jumped out from behind the lines where, where there was protection and got out into the field where there were wounded soldiers and dragged the soldiers to safety, treated them, and because of this, he got the Bronze Medal of Honor. And uh, Randy closes the, the chapter with this sentence. He says, in the 50 years that my parents were married, because his mom didn't know about it either, and in the thousands of conversations my dad had with me, it had just never come up. I think we can share in his shock that something so significant, I mean, winning the medal, you know, a bronze uh, medal of honor, um, that it had just never come up. As Christians, I think we can share in a little bit of that shock that some of the things that are most important to us rarely come up to the people around us in conversation. Um, we have conversations with people every day, our, our spouses, our friends, our family members, our neighbors, our, our kids, our co-workers. But the most important thing that we believe, we would say, is the gospel. It rarely comes up. We want to share the gospel. We know that we should. We look for chances to share the gospel. 
But it, we just, if you're like me at least, it feels like it, it doesn't happen that often. When we look at this text this morning, we find out John the Baptist didn't have that problem. Right? John the Baptist doesn't wait for Jesus to come up in conversation. Everything he's sharing is about Jesus. Everything he's sharing is the gospel. That's what the text says. It says, with many exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. John the Baptist was the the voice crying in the wilderness. Um, He was the one who had said to them, the axe is already laid at the root of the tree, and every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is going to be cut down. So that the crowd is listening, the crowd's tracking with him, and their first question is, what do we do? And that's what we looked at last time, and John the Baptist's basic answer was, you live a radically different life. Being a a follower of Jesus means that there are, are real and radical changes that happen in your everyday life, and he listed out what those looked like for different people. But the crowd's second question is what we're going to look at this morning, and the crowd's basic question is, well, who is John the Baptist? What what exactly is going on here? But John, when he answers the question, well, who are you? He talks about Jesus. He didn't get distracted by talking about himself or current cultural debates. John talks about Jesus. And I want you to see from this text this morning that we need to talk about Jesus. Sharing the gospel is talking about Jesus, right? Sometimes we zero in on the facts about the gospel or on the response that people should have to the gospel, and those are both good. But I think that these words in this text call us back to remember the person of the gospel, what the whole story, what is the whole good news about. The good news is about a person. It's about Jesus himself. Jesus is the reason that we share the gospel, and Jesus is also... The, the, the person that's at the center of the gospel. So if we lose Jesus as our motivation for sharing the gospel, chances are we're never going to really end up sharing the gospel very often. And if we lose Jesus as the center and the substance of the gospel, then I think sometimes we just up, end up sharing maybe some, some good facts and, and good truth, but we miss the person that the gospel is centered around. John the Baptist preaches the gospel by talking about Jesus. And if we want to point people to Jesus, then we need to talk about Jesus. Notice, first of all, that John the Baptist talks about the greatness of Jesus. So the crowd's basic question is, who is this guy? It says, when the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether or not he was the Christ. Now remember, it had been 400 years since there had been any word from God. The the glory had departed from the temple. There were no prophets. There were no miracles that were being done. It seemed like God had abandoned his people. And now John the Baptist has shown up in in the desert. Crowds are flocking to hear him. He's preaching like no one else has preached in, in hundreds of years. And he's baptizing people. So people are starting to think, okay, maybe he's the guy. Maybe this is it. The, the Messiah is the anointed one, the long-awaited one. All through the Old Testament, God's people knew somebody was supposed to be coming that was going to, to be the, the one that would set God's people free and would set everything right. Put yourself in John the Baptist's shoes here for a second. People are basically asking him if he's the greatest of all time, right? It's, it's a pretty high compliment to even be put in this category. I mean, you can imagine a basketball player being asked, well, are you, you know, the next Michael Jordan? You know, or a golfer saying, oh, are you the next Tiger Woods? Um, If it was a preacher, someone would say, oh, you know, I heard somebody preaching up there. It kind of sounded a little bit like uh, C.H. Spurgeon, you know. Um, Just to be placed in that category is is one of the highest compliments that you can be paid, right? Um, It's incredible that anyone's even asking this question, coming up to John the Baptist and saying, so... Are you him? I mean, are you the Messiah? And if you think about it, you know, John um, could have left that possibility open, right? It would have been good for his PR. It would have been good for his publicity to kind of keep the crowds waiting and wondering. It always cracks me up around, you know, when it gets closer to the the presidential election and they ask people, like, are you going to run for president? 
and they never give them a straight answer, right? Because either they don't want to absolutely say no, because then that kind of puts them out of that category of somebody who might be running for president. But they also don't want to say yes yet because their official announcement hasn't come up yet. So there's all these, you know, political thing, political speak kind of words. They, oh, I'm looking into it, maybe, possibly. You know, and maybe John the Baptist could have given an answer like that, right? Ah, uh, well, let's see, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, but come back tomorrow for my next sermon, right? He could have talked that way. He could have thought that way. But what does John the Baptist do? He shuts it down hard, right? He doesn't leave open any possibility. And why does he do that? Because John the Baptist is overwhelmed with the greatness of Christ. That's why John really won't even tolerate people putting him in the same category as Jesus. He says, no, 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 wait a second. You, you, you've got it all wrong. He's, John answered and said to them, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The reason that John doesn't get sidetracked or, or flattered by the crowd's question here is that he knows how great Jesus really is. He says that Jesus is stronger than he is. Jesus is mightier. John says he's not even worthy enough to untie his sandals. In that day and age, the, the, uh, you know, the, the Jews had their, their customs that were written out and things like that, and the, the, the Jewish custom said that a Jewish slave couldn't be made to untie someone's sandal. Um, because that was even too, it, it had to be a non-Jewish person that would untie somebody else's sandal. That's how low and debasing it was. Um, you have to, we think today, of, you know, taking off somebody's sandal, that doesn't sound too bad. But of course, back then, they were walking everywhere. There was no modern underground sewage, right? And they were using animals to get everywhere, and there was no paved roads. So when you put all those things together, after you were out walking for miles and miles in bare feet, essentially, but just with sandals on, when it came time to take those sandals off, it was a pretty gross and disgusting job. Um, a couple of weeks ago, you guys know, we, we went, uh, me and a couple guys from church went hiking, and the weather was good while we were out there, but the week leading up to it, it had been raining all the time. And so the trail was just, in a lot of places, like pure mud. Um, wherever you went to step, you needed to step very carefully or you were going to be either ankle deep or shin deep or maybe knee deep in mud. Um, so that's, you know, a little extra adventure part of it, right, as you're walking along. But you can imagine how after we walked all day on the trail like that, what our shoes looked like at the end of the day. And uh, you can imagine if we were sitting around at the end of the day and one of the guys said to someone else, hey, do you mind taking off my shoes, <laughs> you know? They don't think any of us would have taken up with them up on that offer, right? I would have taken off your shoes, you know, unless both of your arms are broken or something, you know, like, you got to take off your own shoes. That's gross. I don't want to take off your shoes. But what John the Baptist here actually says is, I, would, I wouldn't even be worthy to do that. He, he wouldn't do it, not because it's a gross and disgusting job, but because I'm not even willing, I'm not even in the category of somebody that should be serving you. That I'm actually, it's not that the job is too low, it's that I'm too low. I couldn't even do that. That's what John the Baptist says here. He's so overwhelmed with the worthiness of Christ that he says, it, it, it's, I'm not even worthy to, to be serving him in the lowest possible ways. John has this sense of the greatness of Jesus, the greatness of Jesus' power, the greatness of Jesus' worthiness. I mean, if you think about it, you could start to see where the crowd and maybe even John the Baptist could start to put John the Baptist and Jesus in the same category. Um, John the Baptist and Jesus both had uh, miraculous birth stories. Um, they both came from godly homes. Um, they were about the same age. They were related to each other. They were both preaching. They were both baptizing. So you can kind of see where maybe people are starting to see, okay, this Jesus guy, he, Jesus is kind of just coming onto the scene. John the Baptist, he has crowds coming out to, to, to hear him. Which it, they kind of seem similar at first glance. But John the Baptist knows that, that he's not in Jesus's category. 
Um, it's a little bit like a, a sparkler and a stick of dynamite, right? Like they, they both light on fire and sparkle, but one has true power. John the Baptist says he baptizes. He's putting people underneath the water and they're getting wet. But Jesus is coming and he's going to baptize people with the Holy Spirit and with fire, with the, the fire of judgment. Jesus is the one that deserves real honor and real praise. And John says he's, he's lower than a servant. There's a, a limo driver and the president are both in the same vehicle, right? But they're not really in the same category. When the president steps out, he gets a different attention, right? The crowd applauds and everybody looks at him. No one's looking at the limo driver as they get out. And that's how John sees himself. John is just uh, a servant and actually one that's even, even lower than a servant. And John speaks this way about Jesus because he has this awareness of the greatness of Christ. I think that this takes us back to the fact that we need to have an awareness of the greatness of Jesus in order to share the gospel. That there's someone who we just can't wait to talk about. Notice that how the humility of John works here, right? He doesn't try to put himself down when people say, are you the Messiah? Who, me? Me? Little old me? I could never do that. No, not me. Humility isn't not, is, humility isn't looking like you're not pointing to yourself or trying not to talk about yourself. Humility is pointing to Christ, right? It's an awareness that you are in the presence of someone who is greater. It's not that you, you, you know, as sometimes you think of humility as not wanting to be noticed, but really humility is wanting people to notice Jesus. Someone more worthy, someone stronger than you is present, and you want people to notice him and know about him. I think that it's, uh, it, it's something we can remember as we, at times, might receive some kind of a, a compliment, you know, of, of some, in some way, whether it's in, in a church setting or in your job or at, at your house. And someone's, oh, that's a great job. You did a really good thing there. And, and obviously, it's not that you're looking to try to do some super spiritual response. But when you receive that compliment, are you so aware of the greatness of Christ that you want to get a chance to say, but, but look at Jesus, you know, look at what he's done. Um, instead of just kind of take, maybe taking that compliment and, and, and taking that for ourselves. I told this story uh, several months ago now when we were in Luke chapter one. Um, so I know I've told it recently, but it fits perfectly here and I think probably most of you were here, so in case you weren't, I'll tell it again. But it's that story about the, the piano that Beethoven um, uh, composed most of his music on. It's supposed to be the most valuable piano in, in the world because it's the piano, it's Beethoven's piano, and they valued it at over $50 million. And there's this story about the, a group of college students that was visiting the museum in Germany where this piano is kept. And this college student was trying to convince the guard to let her sit down and play the piano. And of course, he told her he wasn't supposed to. And she kept on kind of bothering him and eventually gave him a, you know, gave him a couple dollars on the side. And so he let her play the piano. And she slipped behind the ropes and played a couple of bars of the, you know, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. And all of her friends were impressed and clapped. And then she got up and she asked the guard, she said, some famous people must have played this piano, right? And he said, well, not exactly. And uh, he told the, the story of Ignacia Paderewski, who was this grand master composer and piano, one of the most famous composers and pianists in Europe at the time, who was given a private tour by the curator of the museum. Um, to, and then he was brought to that piano, and the, the director of the museum said, here, you know, why don't you play some here on Beethoven's piano? And the, the man sat down at the keyboard and couldn't bring himself to play. Um, he had tears in his eyes and, and just sat there in a reverent silence um, to be able to sit at the piano where Beethoven composed his music. And I, I think that that composer's reverence gives us that same idea of the awe and the reverence that we should have towards Christ. The, to, to be aware of his greatness and to be aware of the fact that we are in his presence 
um, changes how we talk about him. And in fact, it motivates us to talk about him. I think that sometimes as Christians, we, we are too flippant and too careless with talking about Jesus. Um, that we, we use his name kind of like the, as a replacement for Santa Claus or some cosmic force of, oh, Jesus might do this or Jesus might get you. And we're not really talking about the risen Christ. We're just kind of using his name um, offhand and, and maybe thoughtlessly. But really, when we think about who Jesus is, we, it drives us to talk about Jesus like, like John the Baptist does here. Somebody who's stronger than me. Somebody who's more worthy than me. And I think that when we're in awe at the greatness of Jesus, he's going to come up in conversation more. We want to talk about him. If you think about it, sharing the greatness of Jesus is sharing the gospel, right? It's good news that Jesus is stronger than we are. It's good news that Jesus is perfectly and wonderfully worthy. The, the greatness of Jesus is the message, but also the greatness of Jesus is our motivation for sharing the message. Um, we are so overwhelmed at how big he is and how great he is that we want to talk about him. And I, I am convinced, and I know that this, I definitely include myself in this as well, but part of the reason that we don't share Jesus more is that we are more focused on our greatness than on his, right? Like the things that we're really impressed with and the things that we're really focused on are too often things in ourselves instead of really seeing Jesus for who he is and, and being so amazed at his greatness that we want to point people to him. We want to talk about him. It was, remember what the apostles said when, when they were told, look, just stop talking about Jesus. You know, they got called in by the Pharisees and Sadducees in Acts 4, and they said, look, just stop talking about Jesus. And they thought that was the answer. But of course, the, the apostles responded, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And when we see the greatness of Jesus, we can't help but talk about it, right? We're going to want to speak about him. And everything that we do for the Lord, every time that we serve the Lord, even in very out-of-the-way small things like watching nursery or maybe coming to prayer meeting or maybe doing something for somebody that no one else knows about, when we're doing it for the Lord and we do it with that awareness of his greatness, it gives us the strength and the motivation to do it. Everything that we do for the Lord has to start with a sense of the greatness of Jesus. And that's what's going to lead us to talk about him. So we talk about Jesus' greatness. But secondly, I want you to see here in the text that we talk about Jesus' coming. John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John doesn't just talk about the greatness of Jesus. He also talks about the fact that this great Jesus is on his way. He's going to be here soon. John says, I've been doing water baptism but the baptism that Jesus is going to do, and Jesus is going to do water baptism as well, but Jesus' water baptism is going to symbolize the fact that he has given the Holy Spirit to his followers. Baptism, when we are baptized in Jesus' name, it's, it's an a, a external picture of the internal reality that the Holy Spirit now lives inside this person. So, again, you'll already notice something happening here. John the Baptist is already starting to fade into the background. You might expect John the Baptist to say, look, this guy Jesus is coming, up, coming and when he comes here, he's gonna be, I'm gonna, we're going to be on the same team. We're going to be together. We're going to be doing some great things. But that's not what he says. He says Jesus is coming, and when Jesus is here, he's everything you need. He's got it all. Um, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
And if you're here this morning and you've given your heart and your life to Christ, you've repented of your sin, you've trusted in what he did for you on the cross, the, the sign that that's happened is that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Yes, we have the ceremony of baptism that shows that, and you should go through that ceremony as we talk about often here. But the, one of the signs that you are a follower of Jesus is that he has given you the Holy Spirit to live inside you every single day. And this is another one of those things that we, we know, we've heard it often, but I think still on a day-to-day -day basis, we really forget that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Living inside of us. Not occasionally coming there and, and, and doing something in our life, but the Holy Spirit comes and dwells with us. He lives inside of us. And that changes how we talk to people. It changes how we use our free time. It changes our prayer life. It changes how we read our Bible. It changes how you encourage other believers and use the gift that God's given you. You have been baptized. You've been immersed in the Holy Spirit by Jesus Christ. So that's the first part of what Jesus is coming to do. But the second part of what Jesus is coming to do actually hasn't happened yet. And again, I've really been surprised in this text when you look through Luke chapter 3 and John the Baptist is talking about Jesus coming. We always think about that first Jesus, that first time that Jesus comes is what John the Baptist was preparing for. And that is true, but John the Baptist talks about Jesus' second coming just about as much as he talks about his first coming. He's talking about, he says that when he's preparing the way so that all flesh will see the salvation of God. And then he says that Jesus is coming with, with an axe to cut down the trees that don't bear fruit. And here in this text, he says that Jesus is coming with a winnowing fork in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So um, that's, that's what Jesus is, Jesus is coming to judge this time. Um, and this, the, the, when he comes the second time, this, uh, this fire, because you know, he says Jesus is going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And um, there's some debate about what, what exactly John the Baptist means by fire. Some people say it's like the purifying effect of the Holy Spirit, or um, it's the, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that the, when the Holy Spirit comes, there were tongues of fire that were seen at Pentecost. Um, but really, the best way to take this is because of this verse 17, it's talking about the fire of judgment. Um, it's talking about the, the fire that Jesus is going to come um, that is the, the fire of, of punishment. Um, when Jesus comes the second time, um, he is going to judge everyone who rebels against him. And... and John the Baptist uses this scene here that is a familiar scene in, in the Bible. It would have been a very familiar scene during this time of people that would have been threshing wheat. You would have picked the wheat out of the field, then you would have crushed it up with a millstone or some kind of big heavy rock. But then when you crushed it up, you have the wheat kernels that you want and they're good. And then you have the chaff, which are these little broken husks that, that aren't really good for anything except to be burned. And the way that you would separate them was with this winnowing fork, which was basically like a big, huge shovel that they would toss it up in the air. And then when they did that, that motion, just a little, the chaff is so light that it would just fall to the side and the wheat that was good that you wanted to keep would fall back to the ground. So John is saying that Jesus, when he comes, this is the, really the separate time, the second time, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. He's going to separate those who have the Holy Spirit and are living differently from those who don't have the Holy Spirit and are still living their sinful lives. And Jesus is coming to divide. Jesus is coming to separate those who are his followers, who he's going to gather into his own. So Jesus coming the second time is good news for, uh, for all of us who are his followers. We're going to get gathered into him. It's bad news for people who aren't followers of him because they are going to be sentenced to unquenchable fire. So it's not a normal fire that eventually kind of peters out on its own. Eventually a normal fire runs out of fuel and then it's done. But this is an unquenchable fire, a fire that doesn't stop, the fire of judgment. Everyone knew that back then the only thing that they would do with chaff, there wasn't, there's not a lot of wood in that area. So if you had chaff and you had something that was burnable, you would use it to, to get your oven hot. You would use it for heat. And so Jesus 
says that this is what, John says this is what Jesus is going to do when he comes the second time. For some, it's, it's a relief. It's what we've been waiting for, right? It's, we've been waiting for Jesus to come and make this world right. And we get gathered into Jesus' barn. And for others that don't know Christ, it's terrifying judgment. When we talk about Jesus, I think we need to talk about the fact that Jesus is coming. I think that sometimes we are a little afraid to talk that way because it sounds weird, right? Uh, if we say, well, I believe one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to punish people who sin, and if you know him, he's going to take you to himself. At, in our day and age, it only believes in what you can see and doesn't believe in supernatural things. When we say we are waiting for Jesus to come back, that sounds kind of weird. But I, you know, it doesn't matter, right? It's what, it's what the truth is. It's what Jesus said. It's what, it's what John the Baptist said. Um, sometimes, you know, in movies or comics or TV shows, you know, there'll be some guy on a street corner that has the sandwich board sign that says the end is near, you know, and that's always a person that's kind of like whacked out and crazy and everything. And I mean, there probably are some weird people that do that. And they're, you know, if you see somebody preaching on the street, they could be a good gospel preacher and they may be somebody who's really far out there. But somebody saying that Jesus is coming back soon isn't saying anything weird. That's what Christians have been believing ever since Jesus has come, right? This is what John the Baptist was preaching. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming soon. And when he comes, he's going to set everything right. He's going to judge sinners. He's going to take those that are his to himself. That's what we believe. So I think that we should look for chances to talk to the people around us about the fact that Jesus is coming back. Talk to our kids about it. Talk to our neighbors about it. Talk to our coworkers about it. If it makes us sound a little weird, it makes us sound a little weird, but it's the truth. Jesus is coming back. We don't know how long it's going to be. So we need to tell and talk to the people around us about it. So we need to talk about Jesus. We need to talk about how great he is. We need to talk about how he's coming back. And lastly, I just want you to see, we need to talk about the truth of Jesus because that's what gets John the Baptist in trouble here. It says that, so with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. And when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. So basically, these verses have all just been a summary of what John the Baptist was preaching. John the Baptist was preaching the gospel. He was preaching the good news. He was preaching the good news that Jesus was coming. He was preaching the good news that Jesus is strong. He was preaching the good news that Jesus was worthy. And so because of that, he was saying you need to repent because there's an opportunity for you to repent of your sin and live a different life and so that you can be his when Jesus returns. So this message offends some people, right? There were undoubtedly people, just regular people, who were in the crowd and thought, mm, I don't really like that. I'm not going not gonna to listen to that and walked away. The problem is, is that when people who are in power <laughs> get offended, then they, um, they use that power to persecute you. And that's what happened to John. John speaks up about Herod's sin. Um, we know, of course, from these verses, it wasn't like John the Baptist was just out there trying to stir up trouble and poke people, you know, talk about big famous people uh, to you know, get himself in trouble. He was talking about everybody's sin. He was confronting the crowd on their sin. And apparently at some point in time, he talked about Herod's sin and that got him upset. Um, Herod um, convinced his, his half-brother to divorce his wife, um, Herodias. Herodias is actually also Herod's half-sister. So in this one act, Herod commits an act of adultery and also incest. And John the Baptist has the courage to say, that's against God's law. That's sin. Um, Herod was not a religious leader. Herod was not, a, um, was not a Jew. But it didn't matter because it was still God's law. And John the Baptist spoke the truth. John the Baptist doesn't make a calculation here, right, of should I maybe just word things just right so that I don't offend Herod? He just tells the truth and just says that what Herod did was wrong. I think we have to be prepared that when we talk about Jesus, some people are probably going to get offended. That's part of why I think Luke wraps up the account this way. When you talk about Jesus, 
some people are going to get offended and we should we should anticipate that we should know that's going to happen um, it happened to John the Baptist of course Jesus says if they persecute me they're going to persecute my followers we know that Jesus is persecuted so we should expect that as followers of Jesus it's not anything out of the ordinary but I think the other reason that Luke closes out the story of John the Baptist here this way, because if you go through the whole first three chapters of Luke, it's been John the Baptist, Jesus, John the Baptist, Jesus, John the Baptist, Jesus, and their birth story, and, um, and all these different things that happen, have happened. And here, this is the last mention of John the Baptist in Luke until there's one, except for one other spot um, that comes up chapters later. But at this point, John the Baptist goes off of the scene right he, he's not you were not really going to see much more about him but john the baptist was focused on christ so john the baptist knew it was okay for him to fade into the background right that has been his message it says in john that he his message was he must increase and i must decrease so john the baptist didn't have to make these calculations of well if i speak out and then I'm going to like, if I get thrown in prison, I can't be out here preaching to the crowds, right? Or I can't be out here baptizing people. Who's going to baptize all these people? Who's going to preach the sermons if I get thrown in jail? John the Baptist says it doesn't matter. All that matters is the truth of Christ. I'm going to speak the truth. Um, Martin Luther wrote the, in the Mighty Fortresses Our God as he was being persecuted for speaking the truth. He said, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. So John the Baptist makes the commitment, I'm going to speak the truth, and whatever happens, happens. If I, get, if I need to get um, you know, pushed off into the background, then that's fine. It didn't matter, and that's exactly what happened. Of course, John the Baptist goes to prison, and of course, then in that, the attention goes on to Jesus even more. The good illustration of this is the, the ministry of George Whitfield. Whitfield, you know, is this famous evangelist in the 1700s. They, they say that George Whitfield was kind of the first celebrity in America in the early colonies. Um, ben Franklin here in Philadelphia, who was not a Christian, figured out that he could make money selling Whitfield sermons. And also, he was, Ben Franklin was one of the first guys that came up with the idea of selling little trinkets, like little, little figurines almost, and coins with Whitfield's name on it, because Ben Franklin realized there was a financial opportunity here, because Whitfield was a popular guy. Um, he was preaching here in America and preaching in England, and people heard about him. Of course, if you know that Whitfield gets into this kind of controversy with the Wesleys, John and Charles Wesley, they were starting the, the Methodist movement, which is still around today. And so people went to Whitfield, who was really more popular than the Wesleys, and they say, listen, you need to start your movement. Like, where's, where's your movement that's going to go on after you die? And there were actually even a group of people that started calling themselves uh, Whitfieldites. Maybe it didn't stick around just because of the name. It doesn't, doesn't really sound too good, right? But this was Whitfield's response to them. Whitfield said, let my name be forgotten. Let me be trodden under feet by all men, if Jesus may thereby be glorified. Let my name die everywhere. Let even my friends forget me, if that means that the cause of the blessed Jesus may be promoted. I want to bring souls, not to a party, in other words, a group of people, but to a sense of their undone condition by nature and to true faith in Jesus Christ. Whitfield said, I want Jesus Christ to be exalted. That's all that matters. He said the same thing really that John the Baptist does here. I can fade into the background as long as Christ gets exalted and lifted up. And that's what we find here in this text is John the Baptist talking about Jesus. And brothers and sisters, we need to talk about Jesus. Can I just say, I want to talk about Jesus more. It doesn't make any sense that we love Jesus so much and then he rarely comes up in conversation. With our friends, with our family members, our neighbors, with my kids, I want to talk about Jesus more. And if we live in the awe of the greatness of Jesus, if we know and expect that Jesus is coming, and if we love the truth of Jesus, then I think that we are going to talk about Jesus more. And I think it's part of the, what we're doing every time we hear the word, every time we come to church and hear the word, every morning that you open up God's word, you are looking for a view of Jesus that you want to share right something about jesus that is so important and that is so magnificent that you want to share it with somebody 
You want to talk about him. We naturally talk about the things that matter most to us. So as we, as we pray and as we read the word, we are asking God to do that work in our hearts, that we would have this exalted view of Jesus that, would, that we would want to share with somebody. Um, Tim Keller said that religious people find God useful, Christians find God beautiful. Religious people find God useful, Christians find God beautiful. And I think that if we find God beautiful, if we find Christ beautiful, we will talk about him more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just ask that this week you would give us chances to talk about Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would allow us to live in a greater awe of who your son is, that we would love him more and enjoy him more and want him more, and that because we love him and because we have that view of him, we would want to share him with people. So, Lord, would you give us chances in this coming week to point people to your son, to to talk about him with people, and let people know how truly great he is. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.